Now we connect with experts on an issue making headlines. The COVID-19 outbreak has been a worldwide pandemic, hurting all societies and economies, and the disease truly knows no boundaries. But countries so far have been increasing trade barriers than jointly moving towards recovery. Taking centre stage, of course, is the on-again, off-again trade war between the United States and China. US officials said this week that the Trump administration is turbocharging its initiative to remove supply chains from China, considering fresh tariffs to make Beijing pay for the handling of the coronavirus outbreak. To discuss the growing sense of division and a possible end to decades of trade liberalisation, we have joining us today Richard Fontaine, Chief Executive Officer of the Centre for a New American Security, who served as a foreign policy advisor to the late Senator John McCain. Jack Gal, Programme Economist at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, and Abraham Newman, Director of the Motara Centre for International Studies and a Professor of Government at Georgetown University. Well, my first question to you, Dr Fontaine. America's trade war with China it initially started over a period of economic prosperity, but now US businesses have been paralysed and they're hemorrhaging money as the pandemic rages on. But rebuilding supply chains and production at home, do you see President Trump pushing through with this? I mean, do you think uh, US firms will be able to withstand higher costs of production and procurement if reshoring takes place? I don't think that uh, there's going to be as much reshoring as the administration anticipates, even if they put in place high tariffs or take other policy measures or businesses on their own make the decisions as they've already started to do to move production out of China. It's unlikely that those uh, production facilities are all just going to come back to the United States. They'll go to other countries, either in the Western Hemisphere where labor costs are lower or potentially in Asia and other places as well. So what I think you're likely to see coming out of all this is a more diversified supply chain and production um, process where there's not the single point of failure and not in China uh, the way we've seen thus far. Um, but this overall paradigm that uh, businesses will just pick up their factories in China and relocate them to the American industrial heartland, I think is a stretch. Uh, you may see a little bit reshoring, but not very much. So reshoring, it's not going to be as easy as it sounds. You said that there's going to be um, rather a diversification of supply chains. Well, Mr. Gao, how do you think China is going to respond to these uh, measures from the US, I mean, including fresh tariffs? And of course, we can't really forget the massive advancement that the country has seen in high-tech industries like 5G and artificial intelligence. With its, now, um, with its economic clout and the country having been the first to reopen after lockdown, would you say that it's actually now in a better position um, to engage in this trade war? I think that it's fair to say that no nation will emerge from this crisis stronger in a global economy that's substantially weaker. Uh, we're all in beginning to realize uh, that the world as a whole is facing unprecedented global recession and much more limited policy space once we open, uh, such as higher public debt, lower interest rate, and bigger central bank balance sheets. Um, whether China responds to fresh U.S. tariffs is ultimately a political question for the Chinese leaders, but it bears emphasizing that tariffs benefit no one. Uh, they impoverish nations, uh, increases production costs, and, and kill jobs. Uh, what China has shown after a relatively short uh, but intense period of lockdown is that once economies reopen, it is going to be extremely difficult for people to get back their jobs for company to recoup their investments um, and for the economy really to get back to uh, its footing in terms in the face of tremendous global uncertainty. Uh, doubling down on the trade war would kill any lingering hope that once we reopen uh, the global economy would experience a rebound as predicted by, for example, the IMF. So if this trade spat intensifies, then it's not just going to be a loss for the two economies. Many economies are going to be caught in the crossfire as they were doing. Um, well, Dr. Newman, you said last year that the two economies, the US and China, they are too deeply intertwined to actually be decoupled without chaos breaking out. And while well, now some may argue that it is a time of chaos given the pandemic, does a conscious decoupling look any likelier to you? Or do you still see a low chance of uh, these countries all countries in the world becoming polarized into competing blocks? 
So uh, let me just say that I think the word decoupling, it's like uh, glamour. You know, it's it's a, it's an easy distraction. People like to look at that and then kind of be like, oh, yeah, that's the solution. We'll just decouple. But I think as you know, the other uh, speakers have already mentioned, the true cost of decoupling would be so immense for societies. I mean, that's the flip side of this chaos we're seeing right now is just a taste of what real decoupling would mean for our economic daily life. If you look at Brexit, that was supposed to be about decoupling, but in the end, it's really just about recoupling, trying to figure out how to reattach into the global economy. So that being said, I don't think that things are just going to be business as usual going forward. I think that there is going to be a real uh, re-examination of how globalization functions and that uh, up to now efficiency and kind of driving down costs was the main objective of firms and governments and that now uh, thinking about security and vulnerability both uh, for businesses but also citizens is going to be a higher priority so globalization will change but it is not going to be decoupling well, as you said, Dr. Newman, many have seen this crisis as a real test of globalization. So, Dr. Fontaine, it really isn't just the United States that's been moving towards greater protectionist policies. A recent WTO report says that 80 countries so far have introduced export bans or restrictions, of course, mostly on medical supplies, and this has been a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. How would this growing sense of protectionism affect the economic recovery? And could it actually be powerful enough to reverse or even end globalization? Globalization is not going to end um, because the economic incentives that existed before, economies of scale and uh, relying on lower labor costs in one country as opposed to another, those are not going to go away. But it certainly, I think, will change and become more limited in, fa in fashion. You know, the, the protectionism that we've seen thus far has been a striking example of how little uh, actually countries around the world have come together uh, to fight this common enemy of the coronavirus you've seen. And it's not just a Trump administration, America first kind of thing, um, although that's part of it. But, you know, countries like Germany um, are, have prohibited the export of medical supplies even to uh, other countries in the EU common market, which uh, is kind of the opposite of what you were supposed to see. I think you'll see a lot of that specific protectionism subside. Um, but what you're going to, I think, see more of is a shift in focus, including among businesses, uh, to from driving down costs at the lowest possible level, producing where labor costs are lowest, keeping minimum levels of inventory, having single source suppliers to to having lower risk as opposed to just lower costs, spreading things out, diversifying sources of supply, pulling things out of China, for example, because the risk is not just pandemic, it's also political risk. And on top of that, you'll have governments that want to push in that direction as well. And so what you'll have, I think, ultimately is a, is a, a different, more limited version of globalization with more regionalism um, and less, um, hopefully less vulnerability in the, in the system as a whole. So really, uh all economies, they're going to adapt to a sort of new form of um, globalization in terms of trade. Well, Mr. Gao, what are your thoughts on this? Should we aim to preserve or strengthen the current trade links we have? Well, I do think we should uh, preserve the trade links we have uh, and ideally cut trade barriers. Uh, what the coronavirus has really shown is that, as has already been mentioned, uh, that you know having single sourcing is is not desirable um you know a, a lot of voices are calling for multiple sourcing uh instead of single sourcing sort of the just in case production rather than just in time uh but more importantly uh i wanted to bring up that over the past three decades as you've mentioned sort of the quest for efficiency and minimization of costs have really driven the agenda of uh, globalization we ended up having a economic globalization that privileges uh, the movement of goods and capital, but rides roughshod over other legitimate concerns, for example, labor, uh, environment, climate, and certainly uh, public health. So after the reset, other than just sort of restoring uh, global trade, I think uh, there's, there's room for us to rethink these other things as well. Well, Dr. Neiman, 
which aspects of international trade do you think will inevitably deglobalize or change as a result of this economic crisis? Well, in, in, in my view, there's two paths before us, and it will really depend a lot on leadership about where the leaders of the largest economies take us. Uh, one will be a much more nationalistic, self-centered, and I think one that will lead to a lot more pain for individual people's pocketbooks. Another will be not a return to the 1990s kind of a heyday of Thomas Friedman, the world is flat, but hopefully a world that uh, thinks about the sustainability of globalization, a type of globalization that delivers for a broad swath of uh, societies that protects the environment and thinks about big issues like uh, stability and uh, the long-term sustainability of firms and citizens. Well, as you said, as times change, maybe the idea of globalization should also evolve. Well, just before we go, Dr. Fontaine, at the heart of any relationship is trust and common ground. And the recent G20 meetings and the WTO um, meetings that we've seen recently, they don't seem to be very helpful at this point. How can governments then build that confidence across borders? You've raised the need for an Atlantic Charter. What would this entail and who do you think should take the lead? Yeah, what I meant by um, the idea that we need an Atlantic Charter for the coronavirus is really that we need the mindset of the Atlantic Charter. When uh, when the United States and, and Britain began pro planning for the a post war environment that would have uh, certain principles underlying the world they'd like to see emerge. And they started doing that even before the United States got involved in World War II. So it happened very early. And I think now is a time for everyone to be thinking about what do we want this new world to look like? What do we want this that this order to look like so that something better might unfold? I mean, as you've said, not just the G20, but the G7 and other multilateral fora, you know, they've issued several statements pledging great, large, abstract cooperation and adopted not a single time-bound specific commitment for common action. It really has been mostly every country for itself. You know, we've always wondered what happens when the United States steps back on the international stage. Does China take the opportunity? Um, China's version of leadership thus far seems mostly focused on burnishing its reputation and penalizing countries that might criticize the government in Beijing or have some relationship with Taiwan or something like that. Europe can't really stand in the place of the United States. I think the irreducible reality is that whatever happens in these multilateral meetings, whatever happens sort of Atlantic charter wise, a plan for what comes after, either the United States is going to have to take the lead and set the agenda together with other countries, or it simply won't happen. I think that's just the reality of the world that we're in. I suppose we'll have to wait and see if it does take that leadership position. Well, I'm afraid we, uh, that's all we have time for today. Richard Fontaine, Chief Executive Officer of the Centre for a New American Security, Jack Gao, Programme Economist at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, and Abraham L. Newman, Professor of Government at Georgetown University. Thank you so much for joining the programme. Thank you. Thank you. This is also where we end the show today. Thank you for watching. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with more global insights on issues making headlines. Have a good one wherever you are. Bye bye.